So, here we are, three years into the war, and now nine episodes deep into our American Civil War series. In a sense, we're at the halfway point of this brutal conflict, but things are about to accelerate as we head towards the inevitable and, if you ask me, somewhat disappointing conclusion. Now, I know what you're thinking. Disappointing? Why? Well, if you've been following along, you'll know I've hinted at my feelings about the endgame of this war, and trust me, we'll unpack that in detail in the final two episodes. But for now, let's focus on the here and the now. And there's still a lot of war left to fight. Midway through 1863, the Union had just emerged from the fiery crucible of Gettysburg. And while it was a turning point, it was in the end. What did happen is that the Confederacy's momentum, that drive towards independence from the United States, came to a screeching halt. Gettysburg was one part of it, but we can't forget Vicksburg falling in the West around the same time. Together, they signaled the beginning of the Confederacy's downward spiral. But, make no mistake, the war still had plenty of grim, bloody chapters to go. For the next year and a half, the intensity ramped up. The Confederates weren't about to go quietly, determined to make the Union pay dearly for every mile of ground they gained. And on the Union side, under the soon-to-be Supreme Commander Ulysses S. Grant, the strategy was brutally simple. Attack, attack, and attack again, no matter the cost. Forward, always forward. That was Grant's mindset. It was relentless, and yes, it came at the price of horrific casualties. But he understood something crucial. This war was only going to end through total exhaustion of the Confederacy. So as we move into these final years of the conflict, we're diving deep into the campaigns that finally brought the South to its knees. There's Grant's crushing offensive in the West and the Overland Campaign, Sherman's devastating march to the sea, and the emergence of African-American soldiers finally given a chance to fight for a cause that had evolved into a fight for liberation, for their freedom, and for their enslaved brethren. We're in at the death now. The slow, grinding, and inevitable conclusion is coming, and both sides are about to feel the weight of what's to come. Welcome to Double Helix, Blueprint of Nations. Season 2, Episode 2.9, In at the Death. After Gettysburg, you could feel the exhaustion setting in on both sides. The North and the South were badder, and yeah, General Meade took some heat for not chasing down the retreating Confederates. But honestly, can you blame him? His army had just lost 25,000 men in one of the bloodiest battles of the war. That's no small thing. Gettysburg was a victory, sure, but it came at a staggering cost. And the South? It wasn't just the defeat at Gettysburg. It was the one-two punch of losing Vicksburg as well. The reality was setting in and fast. Any hope of negotiating a peace deal with the North was slipping away. Meanwhile. Up in the Union, victory didn't bring the relief many had hoped for. Sure, the news from Gettysburg gave people something to cheer about, but the overall mood was still one of exhaustion and frustration. The war was dragging on, and the cost in lives and resources, in sheer emotional toll, was starting to weigh heavy. President Lincoln? He was feeling it too. Gettysburg was a turning point, no question but he wasn't fooled into thinking the end was in sight. The Confederacy was down, but they weren't out, and Lincoln knew the hardest part was still ahead. Victory might be coming, but it wasn't going to be quick, and it definitely wasn't going to be easy. One of the first things Lincoln did after Gettysburg was, in typical Lincoln fashion, to work on solidifying the Union's war aims. Now, if we take a quick step back, you remember that at the start, it was all about preserving the Union. That was goal number one. Then, as the war dragged on, it became about ending the institution of slavery. But now, 
Lincoln was thinking even bigger. He wanted to elevate the stakes of this war beyond just geography or slavery. He wanted this to be about the very soul of America, about what the United States was supposed to stand for. And this effort culminated in one of the most famous speeches in American history, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. And yes, I'm throwing in a companion piece where I'll read the speech in its entirety, in case you haven't had the pleasure. I mean, if you're in America, you've probably heard it. You might have even read it in school. But trust me, hearing it again in the context of everything we've been talking about does hit a little different. The speech itself was delivered on November 19th, 1863, at the dedication of the Soldiers' National Cemetery in Gettysburg. And here's the thing. It was short. Like, blink and you miss it short. Just over two minutes. But, wow, did Lincoln pack a punch in those 272 words. Standing on the very ground where thousands of men had fought and died, he redefined the entire purpose of the war. This wasn't just about saving the Union anymore. No, Lincoln framed the war as a test, the test, of whether a nation, built on the idea of equality, as laid out in the Declaration of Independence, could actually survive. It was about proving that the United States, this experiment in democracy and freedom, could endure even the most violent internal struggle, the Civil War. And that's where the true weight of the Gettysburg Address comes in. It wasn't just a speech. It was a moral declaration. Lincoln's words were nothing short of a call to action. A reminder that this war was about more than just territory or even the institution of slavery. It was about the survival of a nation conceived in liberty, a nation built on the radical idea of equality. When he declared that, This nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that a government, of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Well, that's a mic drop moment if I've ever heard one. Inspiring, right? It feels like the kind of speech that should have had unionist crowds going wild with cheers echoing across the land. But, uh, unfortunately, not so much. While Lincoln's words called for a new kind of fight and a renewed sense of purpose, the reception wasn't exactly an instant success we might have imagined today. Some Northerners were deeply moved, absolutely. But for a lot of people, the speech fell flat. It was either too idealistic for their liking or just too short to feel substantial. In fact, some folks walked away thinking, that's it? They didn't quite realize that they just witnessed the making of history. Of course, as we all know now, the rest is history. Over time, the Gettysburg Address wasn't just remembered, it was elevated to the status of one of the greatest speeches in American history. It captured, in just a few words, the moral and political stakes of the Civil War and what was truly at risk. Lincoln's vision, though maybe not fully appreciated at the moment, became a defining statement of what the war, and the nation, was really about. And it's why generations later, we still come back to those words. So, what about the war itself? The actual grinding efforts on the battlefield? Well, in the Western theater, things were really heating up. Union forces, led by General Ulysses S. Grant, were putting the squeeze on the Confederacy. And let's be clear. After the fall of Vicksburg, Grant was no longer just a capable commander. His reputation was skyrocketing. This guy was becoming the guy, and his victories in the West were crucial to the overall Union strategy. These weren't just battles. They were strategic game changers that cut off the Confederacy supply line and divided the southern states, breaking the South into smaller, more isolated pieces. Now, Grant's victories weren't just about cutting off resources. They were psychological blows. And yes, here comes one of my rare but always fitting sports analogies. The Union was delivering body blows over and over again. It wasn't a flashy knockout punch, but it was effective. 
Every hit was sapping the energy out of the Confederacy, destroying its will to fight. With the Mississippi River under Union control, the Confederacy was effectively split in two. Texas, Louisiana, and Arkansas, they were now isolated from the rest of the southern states, and that isolation was another nail in the coffin of the Confederate war effort. It wasn't glamorous. It wasn't the kind of victory that would make headlines in the moment, but it was the kind of slow, relentless grind that would eventually wear the Confederacy down to nothing. Grant knew it, and so did his men. It was only a matter of time. At this stage of the war, the Union was done playing nice. The gloves were officially off. It was time to press the advantage, and the strategy shifted to something that would become very familiar to any 20th century military strategist. Total war. This wasn't just about fighting battles anymore. It was about unleashing the full weight of the Union's resources on the Confederacy. Everything was fair game now. The armies, yes, but also the economy, the infrastructure, and the very will of the South to keep fighting. The goal was simple. Leave the Confederacy with nothing left to fight for and no way to continue fighting. And who better to lead this charge than General William Tecumseh Sherman? Sherman, one of Grant's closest allies, would become the mastermind behind this new, brutal strategy. He didn't just execute the orders. He embodied them. His infamous campaign, which would cut a wide, devastating path through Georgia, would later be known as the March to the Sea. But we'll get into that in a little bit more detail later in the episode. Before Sherman could start that march, though, two more critical battles had to be fought. These are those body blows I mentioned earlier, the ones that, slowly but surely, were draining the Confederacy of the strength that needed to stand. First is the Battle of Chickamauga, fought in September 1863, and it was a bloody reminder that the Confederacy still had some fight left in it. And not just a little fight. This was one of the bloodiest battles of the entire war. General Braxton Bragg's forces, though outnumbered, managed to punch through Union lines and deliver a serious blow, forcing the Union army to retreat to Chattanooga. It was a rare win for the Confederates in the West, and for a moment, it felt like the South was turning the table, giving the Union a much-needed reality check. But, as is so often the case in war, even victory came with a hefty price tag. Bragg's forces couldn't capitalize on the win. Sure, they pushed the Union back, but instead of following up with a decisive strike, Bragg hesitated. The Union army, despite being battered, wasn't broken. They dug in at Chattanooga, and Bragg, rather than pressing his advantage, decided to lay siege to the city. He cut off supply lines, hoping to starve the Union into submission, but, spoiler alert, the siege wasn't going to unfold the way Bragg hoped. Now, Lincoln, sitting in Washington, knew just how critical Chattanooga was. Losing that city would have been a disaster, a real gut punch that could have undone all the progress the Union had made in the West. So, he did what Lincoln does best. He made the right call. He sent reinforcements, and not just any reinforcements, he sent Grant, the rising star of the Union Army, and handed him the keys to the whole operation. Grant, true to form, didn't waste any time. He showed up in Chattanooga in late October and got straight to work. The Union forces there were on the ropes, but Grant knew that with the right plan, they could turn that situation around. His first order of business was to open up a supply line. And that's exactly what he did and what became known as the Cracker Line, a daring and successful operation that brought food and supplies to the starving Union soldiers. Morale shut up, and suddenly, the Union was back in the fight. By November, Grant was ready to go on the offensive, and the battles that followed were some of the most dramatic of the entire war. First up was Lookout Mountain, also known as the Battle Above the Clouds. And picture it, Union soldiers scaling the fog-covered slopes of the mountain, pushing the Confederates back in a stunning victory. The sight of Union flags waving above the clouds must have felt like a moment straight out of a painting, and it was the kind of morale boost that the Union desperately needed. 
But the real hammer came at Missionary Ridge. This was where Grant's leadership and the Union's tenacity came together in a big way, breaking through Confederate lines and sending Bragg's forces into retreat. The Union had reclaimed the momentum in the West, and the victory at Chattanooga set the stage for Sherman's next move, his infamous march to the sea. With Chattanooga firmly in Union hands, the path to the Confederate heartland was wide open, and Ulysses S. Grant, the man who had proven he could get the job done, was about to take the biggest step of his career. Lincoln was ready to make it official. The man who had hammered the Confederacy in the West would now command the entire Union war effort, and everything was about to change. But before Grant rose to the top, let's be real. The Union's leadership was a bit of a revolving door. It was like watching a game of musical chairs, except no one was sitting down and Lincoln was left asking, can someone please sit down? Take that to read, can someone please fight? And the answer was usually always the same. Grant, sir. Grant fights. We saw commanders come and go, like McClellan, Burnside, Hooker, Meade, each with their own ideas or lack of ideas. None of them able to land that knockout punch that Lincoln so badly needed. The Confederates, despite running on fumes, kept hanging on, proving way more stubborn than anyone could have anticipated. So, with the war dragging on and morale thinning, Lincoln knew he needed someone who could stop the bleeding. He needed a general who would fight, who wouldn't back down. And that was Grant. In March 1864, Lincoln made it official. He promoted Grant to lieutenant general, putting him in charge of all Union armies. Lincoln was betting that Grant would bring the same relentless drive he'd shown in the West to the Eastern Theater, where the war will ultimately be won or lost. And Grant? He wasted no time. He launched what would come to be known as the Overland Campaign, a brutal, head-on, no holds bar series of battles designed to wear down Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. When I say relentless, I mean relentless. The campaign kicked off in May 1864, and it was like nothing the war had seen up to that point. This wasn't about clever flanking maneuvers or waiting for the perfect moment to strike. No. Grant had one goal. Lock Lee's army in battle and done let up. If it cost lives, so be it. If it meant pushing his men to the limit, fine. The Union had the numbers, the resources, and Grant's willpower to outlast the Confederates. And that's exactly what he planned to do. It was a war of attrition. Brutal, bloody, and unforgiving. And Grant was prepared to see it through to the bitter end. There's a couple battles, or more than a couple really that show off this new Grant style of warfare, where casualties were almost secondary to the larger goal. The focus was relentless pressure, pure and simple. Bleed the Confederacy white, break them down, not by one knockout blow, but by never giving them a single moment to breathe. We'll zero in on just a couple of these battles because they really drive the point home about how Grant's approach changed the game and how brutal that game was. First up, the Battle of the Wilderness, fought in early May 1864. It was in the dense, tangled thickets of northern Virginia. The terrain was so thick that soldiers could barely see a few feet in front of them. And picture that, fighting in a forest so overgrown, it's more like hacking your way through a jungle, with the enemy practically on top of you. It wasn't long before the whole thing developed into a bloody, hand-to-hand slugfest. And, as if that wasn't enough, the dry forest caught fire. Muskets, artillery, and sparks from the fighting igniting the underbrush. Soon, the flames were sweeping through the woods, trapping the wounded and the living alike. It was a horrific scene. It kind of makes you realize how far beyond traditional battle this war had gone. And here's where Grant shows what sets him apart from those Union commanders who came before him. After the carnage of the wilderness, after losing thousands of men, he did not retreat. Think about that. Any other general up to this point would have pulled back, regrouped, maybe even retreated. But not Grant. He pressed forward. 
pushing south to try to outflank Lee's army. What followed was the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse, a two-week bloodbath that took the brutality up another notch. There was one part of the battlefield that became infamous. It was called the Bloody Angle. For 20 hours, in the middle of a torrential downpour, Union and Confederate soldiers fought hand-to-hand. It was so intense that the bodies of the dead and the wounded piled up, forming an actual barrier between the two sides. For 20 hours. And yet, despite all of this, despite the carnage and the chaos, Grant didn't pull back. He just kept pushing forward. His own men started calling him the Butcher. And you can see why. But here's the thing. Grant knew what he was doing. Lee's army was running out of men, out of resources, and out of time. Every battle was draining them dry, and Grant wasn't about to stop until there was nothing left to fight. And he did not stop. Next came Cold Harbor, where the Union lost over 7,000 men in less than one hour. It was a disaster for Grant, but still, he kept moving forward. To his critics, it looked like pig-headed stubbornness, reckless butchery. But to Grant, this was the strategy. He understood that the Union had the numbers to outlast the Confederacy. It was a war of attrition, and he was going to grind Lee's army down to the bone, no matter the cost. In a way, Grant was ahead of his time, or maybe, depending on how you look at it, a preview of the grim military strategies of the 20th century. His relentless, head-on assaults foreshadowed what would happen decades later in World War I. Generals there would operate in much the same way, throwing men at entrenched positions over and over again. And let's be honest, that's not exactly a compliment. But Grant's goal was clear. He was willing to see it through, no matter how many lives it took. This was total war, and Grant was leading the charge. Speaking of World War I, by June 1864, the war was dragging itself towards the finish line, but not without one last brutal chapter, the Siege of Petersburg. Grant's final move to starve Richmond by cutting off the lifeline that ran through Petersburg. And let's be real, what unfolded there looked less like the Civil War we're used to picturing and more like a preview of the trench warfare that would define World War I. Picture trenches dug deep into the mud, soldiers battling the cold, wet, the seas ridden conditions as much as they were fighting each other. For ten long, grim months, Grant kept on the pressure, slowly squeezing the life out of Lee's army. It was brutal, it was messy, and it was relentless. Everything you'd expect from Grant at this point. The once proud army of Northern Virginia was trapped and down in a trench war they couldn't win, and day after day, night after night, it was artillery, mud, and death. The Confederates were running out of supplies, running out of men, and running out of hope. By the end of 1864, it was clear. Grant had Lee exactly where he wanted him. The Overland Campaign had done its grim work. Lee's army was a shadow of what it once was, bled dry by months of constant pressure. Petersburg wasn't just a battle, it was a slow, grinding death for the Confederacy. And as the Union forces closed in, you could feel the inevitability of what was coming. The end was near, and the Confederacy had nothing left in the tank. Grant had set the stage for the final act, and everyone knew it, whether they wanted to admit it or not. All right. Leaving behind the muddy trenches of Petersburg, we're flying south to Georgia, because now, now it's time to dive into Sherman's infamous march to the sea. You wanted total war? Sherman was ready to give it to you in spades. In November 1864, fresh off of his capture of Atlanta, Sherman launched his campaign of pure, unapologetic destruction. This was the very definition of total war and Sherman had no intention of holding back. Sherman's army, 60,000 strong, cut a swath straight through Georgia, from Atlanta to Savannah. Sherman's men were in a mission to destroy everything that could possibly support the Confederate war effort. 
Railroads were torn up and twisted, crops were burned to the ground, and factories were reduced to smoldering rubble. The goal? Break the back of the South's ability to fight, and, just as importantly, break its will to keep fighting. This was psychological warfare, plain and simple. Sherman didn't just want to defeat the Confederates, he wanted to make it feel like the apocalypse had come to their doorstep. His troops left a trail of destruction that stretched for miles, sparing only civilian homes that had no military value. The warehouses, factories, railroads, fields, if it could help the South, it went up in flames. To the people living through it, Sherman's march felt like the end of the world. And the thing is, Sherman didn't shy away from the brutality. He was clear about his methods, famously saying, War is cruelty. There's no use trying to reform it. The crueler it is, the sooner it will be over. He saw his march as a necessary evil. If it could make a war so unbearable for the South, so devastating, that they couldn't possibly recover, you could end it faster. So, Sherman did just that. He brought the cruelty of war to its absolute peak. And in doing so, he hastened the Confederacy's collapse. Sherman's march to the sea wasn't about heroic charges or battlefield glory. It was about making sure the South had nothing left to fight for and no way to keep fighting, even if they wanted to. And in that grim, relentless way, Sherman succeeded. The South was left reeling, its morale shattered, and by the time his army reached Savannah in December, the writing was already on the wall. I mentioned earlier in this episode that we'd talk about African-American soldiers and their contributions to the war effort, because, believe me when I say, it was significant. Their service began in earnest after the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, and from then on, their role was nothing short of crucial. Now, in the early days of the war, African Americans were largely kept on the sidelines. Free black men were lining up to volunteer, eager to fight for the Union and to help free their enslaved brothers and sisters in the South. But the Lincoln administration, well, they were hesitant, to say the least. For a lot of Northern leaders, this war was still about preserving the Union, not some grand crusade to end slavery. The idea of arming black men and sending them to the front lines wasn't exactly embraced with open arms. But as the war dragged on, well, you know the story. The Union wasn't winning this thing overnight. The body count was climbing. The carnage was piling up. And it became clear that this wasn't going to be short. It was not going to be an easy war. So the Union needed more men, and fast. Plus, by 1863, the moral tide was shifting. Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation didn't just free enslaved people in the rebellious states, it also reframed the war. It wasn't just about keeping the country together anymore. It was now about freedom. And with that shift, African Americans found their way into the ranks of the Union Army. Their contribution? Massive. We're talking nearly 200,000 black soldiers by the end of the war roughly 10% of the entire Union Army. These men were fighting for their own freedom, for the very soul of the nation, and for a future that included them and their families as full members of the society. One of the most famous and, frankly, most inspiring units of the war was the 54th Massachusetts Regiment. Now, if you've ever seen the 1989 movie Glory, you already know what I'm talking about. And if you haven't seen it, well, you've got homework. Pause this episode, but don't forget to come back, find Glory, watch it, and then I promise you'll want to binge all the American Civil War episodes of Double Helix afterwards. I promise. But seriously, this regiment, led by Colonel Robert Gold Shaw, a white officer from a prominent abolitionist family, became a symbol of bravery and determination especially after their legendary assault on Fort Wagner in South Carolina on July 18, 1863. Now, Fort Wagner was no walk in the park. The 54th Massachusetts charged the fort head-on, knowing full well the odds were stacked against them. Out of the 600 men who charged, 
nearly half were either killed, wounded, or captured. Colonel Shaw himself was killed in the assault, and in a final insult, the Confederates buried him in a mass grave with his men, a move that was meant to humiliate him, but that backfired spectacularly as it only strengthened his legacy of solidarity and leadership. Shaw's decision to fight alongside his men and to die alongside his men became a powerful symbol of unity in the fight for freedom. The bravery of the 54 Massachusetts at Fort Wagner didn't just stay on the battlefield. It resonated throughout the North. News of their valor spread, inspiring more African Americans to enlist and helping to change the way people saw black soldiers. And let's be honest, the soldiers got a raw deal. Lower pay, inferior equipment, constant discrimination. They had every reason to be bitter, but they didn't let that stop them. They persevered. Their courage wasn't just about surviving the battlefield, but about standing tall in the face of everything that told them they didn't belong there. Their determination paved the way for future generations of African American soldiers who, despite the obvious contradictions in their fight for a country that didn't yet treat them as equals, laid it all on the line for the hope of a better future. All right, folks, we've been at this for nine and a half episodes, over 30,000 words and close to four hours of audio. And here we are, finally closing in on the end of the war. Not, not the series, though, and don't worry, that's coming too but we're reaching the finale of this long, bloody conflict. When we last left Grant and his army, they were entrenched in the siege lines of Petersburg, holding tight as the war dragged into the final months of 1864 and into 1865. By March of that year, Robert E. Lee knew the writing was on the wall. His once proud army was barely hanging on, and in the last ditch, desperate bid to break the Union grip, he launched an attack on four statmen on March 25th, 1865. And for a brief moment, just a brief moment, it looked like they might turn the tide. The Confederates made some gains, but the Union quickly regrouped and counterattacked, forcing Lee's men back once again. That failed assault, it was the last gasp of a dying army. Then, on April 2nd, 1865, the inevitable happened. Union forces finally broke through the Confederate lines at Petersburg, and that very night, Richmond, the heart and soul of the Confederacy, was evacuated. By the next day, Union troops marched into the city. The once proud Confederate capital was now a smoldering ruin, and so the fall of Richmond was the final death blow. The Confederacy's days were officially numbered. Fast forward to April 9. 1865. Lee, surrounded, outnumbered, and out of supplies, knew it was over. No heroic last stands, no miraculous escape. Instead, in the quiet parlor of Wilmer McLean's home at Appomattox Courthouse, Lee sat down with Grant to negotiate the terms of surrender. It wasn't a drawn-out affair. It was brief, respectful, and honestly, pretty dignified. Grant, ever the pragmatist, offered generous terms to the defeated Confederate forces. There would be no retribution, no trials for treason. Lee's men could take their horses and personal belongings and go home. They were even given rations to help them on their way. And while this may have been a dignified end to the war, I can't help but wonder if maybe, just maybe, it was too lenient. The South had tried to leave the Union. This was, after all, a rebellion. Maybe some harsher terms would have sent a clearer message. Because, as we'll explore in the next couple of episodes, leniency with the South didn't exactly lead to a harmonious post-war America. In fact, you could argue it laid the groundwork for some of the very issues we're still dealing with today. So. While Appomattox ended the fighting, the story of this country was far from over. Keep that in mind as we head into the final stretch of our series, because the aftermath, that's where things get complicated. The surrender at Appomattox effectively brought the Civil War to a close. 
Sure. A few scattered Confederate forces kept up some token resistance in the far reaches of the South. The war, for all practical purposes, was over. The Union had been saved, but it came at an unimaginable cost. The nation had been ripped apart at the seams and then stitched back together, but it wasn't the same. It was like trying to put Humpty Dumpty back together. It could never be. The Civil War didn't just preserve the United States. It transformed it. And that transformation came with scars that we're still dealing with today. But even though the fighting stopped, the hard work was just beginning. Because what do you do after the guns fall silent? How do you rebuild a nation that's been so deeply divided? How do you pick up the pieces when the blood has barely dried? Next time, on Double Helix, we dive into that exact question. We look at what came after the war. The monumental struggle of Reconstruction the challenges of bringing the South back into the fold, and the shocking assassination of Abraham Lincoln. So, until then, thank you for listening, and as always, we'll see you soon.